Amidst its breathtaking beauty and grandeur, the wilderness can also be a harsh instructor. Standing atop a hill after an arduous hike, it's easy to feel invincible. Having pushed oneself to the limits and triumphed over nature's unpredictable conditions, However, even the most experienced hikers can be caught off guard and make simple, novice mistakes. Yosemite National Park, renowned for its stunning landscapes, towering waterfalls, granite rock formations, ancient sequoias, and vast alpine wilderness. Every corner of the park offers something gorgeous to behold. Yosemite is often regarded as one of the most beautiful national parks in the world, a true marvel of American wilderness. Among the iconic landmarks of Yosemite, El Capitan stands tall at 3,500 feet above the valley floor, drawing daring rock climbers from all over the world. Another widely photographed wonder is Half Dome, a breathtaking sight that inspires awe from every angle. Hardcore hikers can trek to its summit, while others admire its granite splendor from a distance. Whether seeking an adventurous vacation, a tranquil immersion in nature, or engaging in hiking, backpacking, or skiing, Yosemite offers a perfect sanctuary. However, for a group of hikers, the Half Dome Lightning Catastrophe excursion turned into one of the park's most devastating disasters. Half Dome, though an exciting challenge for many, became an unexpected adventure for some. Park rangers frequently assist hikers on the Half Dome Trail during the summer. Among those seeking thrill and excitement were co-workers and close friends Tom Rice and Adrian Esteban. They were part of a party attempting the challenging 16-mile round-trick hike to Summit Half Dome. Esteban had convinced some of his work acquaintances to join him on a hiking trip. He managed to get his friend Bill Pippi and their work supervisor Bob Frith to participate. Frith, in turn, invited his best friend, Bruce Weiner, and both of them were recent East Coast transplants to California. Bill Pippi extended the invitation to 16-year-old twin brothers, Bruce and Brian Jordan. Completing the group was co-worker Carl Buckner, who brought along his best friend, Steve Elner. The adventure began as the Rice Esteban group woke up to a beautiful summer sky, ready for a full day of hiking to conquer a renowned granite monolith. The group entered Yosemite Valley, and it was Bruce Weiner's first time experiencing the awe-inspiring surrounding. The monumental granite cliffs stood tall like looming giants, leaving him awestruck. Yosemite Valley is truly breathtaking, especially as you gaze up at the mile-high cliffs from the valley floor. And there it was, Half Dome, with its distinct features. One side a sheer face, and the other three sides smooth and round resembling a dome cut in half. It stood out as the star of the valley, towering nearly 5,000 feet above the valley floor. Bruce Weiner found it difficult to envision himself atop such an imposing mountain, wondering if he could truly accomplish such a feat. After a buffet breakfast at the cafeteria in Camp Curry, they loaded their backpacks with gear, clothing, and food, ready for the two-mile march to the trailhead at the Happy Isles. The sky was clear blue as the group set out, except for a single cumulus cloud floating above. However, as they continued the hike, a few more cumulus clouds formed in the eastern sky. As the hike progressed, Buckner and Elmer fell behind, trailing the group by about 30 minutes, while Rice, Esteban, Pippi, and the Jordan twins were ahead. Frith and Weiner arrived shortly after, around 12.30 p.m., and decided to cool off by diving into the chilly water upriver from the Nevada Fall, engaging in playful antics like schoolboys. Meanwhile, several cumulus clouds in the eastern sky combined and started amassing, with distant rumblings heard around the clouds' rest. Concerned about the threatening weather, Tom Rice and his party packed up, assuring the others that they would be safe and dry in the cave on the summit if a thunderstorm were to hit. Pippi and Bruce Jordan were setting a rapid pace, hoping to outpace the approaching storm. Close behind, Tom Rice and Adrian Esteban made a quick stop at their secret spring, with Brian Jordan soon catching up to them. Back at Nevada Falls, Weiner and Frith were falling behind, burdened by their 45-pound backpacks. Despite their exhaustion, they pressed on, Weiner's muscles beginning to cramp. They finished their water supply, 
and the whiner wanted a longer rest, Frith encouraged him to push on and catch up with the others. Bill Pippi and Bruce Jordan were in a race to reach the top first, both being competitive and in good shape. However, Pippi had an urgent need to relieve himself, leading them to head back briefly. Esteban, Rice, and Brian Jordan were not far behind. As they ascended, they received a warning from two hikers coming down about the approaching storm, but instead of deterring them, it motivated them to pick up the pace and reach the summit. Buckner and Elner were still far behind, but continued their slow progress despite the threat of the lightning storm. Esteban and Rice, well ahead of the others, reached the bottom of the cables at 5.40 p.m. The dark clouds covered the sky and lightning played over the ridges and spires, accompanied by rumbling thunder nearby. At the base of the cables, there was a warning sign cautioning hikers against ascending the mountain during a lightning storm. Half Dome is notorious for lightning strikes due to its smooth granite surface that efficiently conducts electricity. Now, they had to carefully consider their next move. While they could seek shelter in the cave at the top, they would still be exposed to the risks of lightning striking the wet surface of Half Dome, not just limited to the cables they'd be clinging to. A strike higher up on the mountain was even more likely, and the danger extended to any wet areas. As Esteban gazed up and assessed the sky, he felt a light drizzle on his face, hinting at the impending torrential rain. However, this storm seemed no different from the hazards that they encountered in the past, and they were no strangers to such challenges over the years. With a knowing glance exchanged between them, the decision was clear. Rice exclaimed, Screw it! This is our mountain! Let's just do it! Esteban agreed, and despite the looming storm and the warning signs, they pressed on, ascending the cables towards the summit, which was still about 600 feet away. The sky responded with a mosaic of jagged lightning streaks and rolling claps of thunder, adding to the sense of foreboding. In that moment, Esteban felt the need to express his feelings to Rice, saying, Whatever happens, happens. I want you to know I love you. Meanwhile, Jordan had decided to hike at his own pace, eager to impress the older men, and he followed in Rice and Esteban's footsteps without hesitation. Further back, Frith and Weiner approached the cables and the warning sign at the base of the subdome cautioning them. Weiner voiced his concern about waiting out the storm, but Frith reassured him that a cave at the summit would provide refuge, not wanting to hold anyone back as a newcomer. Weiner decided to push on. As Rice and Esteban reached the summit around 6 p.m., they were aware of their vulnerability to lightning strikes on the dome. They hurriedly made their way into the cave, celebrating their success and high-fiving each other. A few minutes later, Brian Jordan joined them, urgently guided by Esteban. Frith and Weiner also appeared at the summit and were welcomed into the cave. Inside the cave, they embraced the moment, proud of their achievement and beaming with joy. However, the rain turned colder and hailstones started clattering on the rocks. The five huddled together, seeking warmth and camaraderie as they prepared for the lightning show outside. Meanwhile, Bill Pippi and Bruce Jordan made a wise decision to stay below Subdome, given Bruce's fear of lightning. Pippi was now severely weakened and dehydrated due to diarrhea. They decided to head back to base camp, where they pitched their tent and sought shelter at approximately 6.15 p.m. Back at the cave, eerie lightning glowed inside casting ghostly hues. In an instant, the cave erupted with a cataclysmic roar as lightning tore across its surface. Esteban was thrown against the wall, screaming without hearing his voice. Darkness engulfed him, leaving him numb and unable to move. He had limited contact with the granite, which confined the electrical charge to the left side of his body, luckily avoiding the full impact of the strike. Weiner was also fortunate, as he was touching the wall with only his rear and thighs. He felt no sensation from the waist down, moaning in pain, but remaining the most coherent among the group. Weiner looked at Brian Jordan, who appeared shockingly vacant and dazed. Realizing the danger, Weiner urged them to leave the cave. Surveying the scene, he saw Rice slouched against the granite wall in a fetal position, his body jerking and twitching. His legs were badly charred, and his once blonde hair was blackened by the lightning strike. 
As Esteban regained consciousness, he noticed Brian Jordan slump forward, the smell of burning flesh hanging in the air. Brian appeared lifeless, leaving Esteban horrified by the grave consequences of his and Rice's actions. Struggling with his paralyzed leg, he looked around and witnessed Firth vomiting, with his eyes rolled back, revealing their whites. Firth's forehead bore a gash as if a white hot dagger had been plunged into his skull. His body thrashed, teetering on the edge of the ledge, dangerously close to falling off. Esteban acted swiftly, reaching out to snag Firth's waistband and pulling him back from the precipice. However, Firth's body continued to convulse toward the edge as if seeking something beyond. Esteban strained to hold on and called for help. Weiner, seeing his friend in peril, grasped Firth's sweater, attempting to aid Esteban. Together, they struggled to keep Firth from falling, but with both of them paralyzed from the waist down, they lacked the necessary leverage to control his violent convulsions. Amid the chaos, Weiner desperately held on, while Esteban, facing the reality of their situation, made the difficult decision to let go. Firth convulsed, sliding closer to the edge, dragging Weiner along with him. In horror, Weiner had no choice but to let go. He and Esteban helplessly watched as Firth disappeared over the precipice, falling to the rocks 2,220 feet below. Weiner screamed and began to sob, devastated by this tragedy. Turning his attention to Rice, Esteban saw his left leg twisted beneath a dislodged rock. Rice was making unintelligible noises, gagging unregurgitated broccoli. Esteban attempted to restore consciousness, but Rice's severe burns were still smoking. Outside, atmospheric crackling filled the air, adding to Esteban's fear and desperation to escape. Summoning all his upper body strength, Esteban crawled to the tunnel entrance and out onto the summit. He focused on reaching a nearby crevasse called the outhouse, about 150 feet away. Crawling frantically, he finally reached the depression, overwhelmed with relief at being alive. Meanwhile, back at the cave, Weiner was deeply shaken by the disaster that had befallen them. His injured leg made it unthinkable to climb down the cables, so he decided to stay put, hoping to avoid being a human lightning rod. He prayed that another strike wouldn't occur and remained immobile. Suddenly, buzzing and crackling filled the air again. There was no time for Weiner to react before another blinding explosion blasted the granite, tearing through the cave. Weiner experienced an out-of-body sensation, watching his own convulsing body before gradually feeling a sharp pain in his chest. He lay motionless, his shirt stuck to his exposed skin due to the burns. Rice regained consciousness, screaming in agony as Weiner's body lay on his leg. Rice's other leg was grotesquely bent under a rock. Nearby, Brian Jordan appeared lifeless, his face bluish, and his body slumped over. Weiner yelled for help as the storm finally passed, leaving only a faint rumbling of thunder in the distance. Esteban, thinking the danger had subsided, left the crevasse and crawled back towards the cave. He spotted someone coming over the ridge at the top of the cables and waved his arms to get their attention. The approaching hiker was Mike Hook, a trained EMT. As Hook entered the cave, he was met with the devastating scene that had befallen the hiking party. The smell of burnt hair and flesh lingered in the air. Rushing to assist, he first attended to Brian Jordan, who showed no pulse and had sadly passed away. Hook then returned his attention to Rice and Weiner. Esteban, who had regained full use of his legs, approached the cave to help. Rice pleaded with him not to leave him behind, referencing a previous incident with Hogan. Esteban carried the two injured hikers out of the cave and placed them on the open granite, where Linda Cozier, an EMT trainer from another hiking group, and others provided assistance. Meanwhile, Pippi and Bruce Jordan were ready to begin their ascent and had returned to the cables. Buckner and Elmer also arrived at the cables, and together they decided to regroup and repack their backpacks. Just as they were about to start their ascent, they encountered a frantic hiker rushing down with news of a lightning strike that had hit hikers at the top. Elmer decided not to continue and headed back down. Pippi initially refused to believe the strike involved anyone from their group, blocking that notion from his mind. On the cables, they met another hiker hurrying down, who informed them that two people were killed, one of them a young kid. These words stunned Buckner, 
Pippi, and Bruce Jordan, the latter worried that it could be his twin brother who was killed. They continued their climb, the tragedy hanging heavily over them. Upon reaching the summit, they saw Rice, who informed them that Brian had fallen over the edge and Frith was killed. Buckner couldn't handle the news and descended the cables to meet up with Elner at the base camp. The news of the unfolding tragedy left them unable to sleep, each grappling with the horrifying reality of their comrade's death. As Pippi and Bruce Jordan arrived with the others, Pippi was inconsolable, feeling guilt over Brian's death while he was in his care. Around 9.30 p.m., Hook reached a ranger station and informed him about the situation on top of Half Dome. The rangers promptly prepared supplies and set out on foot to reach the summit. A helicopter was considered, but due to the darkness and danger of low altitude flying without sufficient moonlight, it was deemed too risky. However, around 11 p.m., the moonlight broke through, prompting the rangers to dispatch a helicopter from Modesto. As the rangers on foot reached the summit, Linda briefed them about the situation and they prepared for the helicopter's arrival. Just around midnight, the unmistakable sound of helicopter rotor blades grew louder. The rangers gathered flashlights to create a landing zone on the summit. Time was crucial, as the helicopter had to act quickly before the moonlight vanished, potentially leaving them stranded overnight. Finally, the helicopter reached the summit. The helicopter could only accommodate one patient at a time, and it was decided that Weiner needed immediate attention as he was in the worst condition. As he was the first to be evacuated down to the valley, around 1.15 a.m., the helicopter returned for Rice, who was also flown down. Lastly, Esteban, who didn't need a stretcher, was evacuated from the summit. After the incident, Rice and Weiner's injuries were determined to require specialized care at UC Davis Medical Center. Meanwhile, on the summit of Half Dome, the remaining hikers, including Bill Pippi and Bruce Jordan, were emotionally and physically drained. The group showed strong cohesion and mutual affection, along with the other hikers who stepped in to assist. Around 6.30 a.m., a Yosemite National Park helicopter lifted off to retrieve the bodies of Bob Frith and Brian Jordan. They located Frith among the rocks at the base of Half Dome before flying to the summit to retrieve Brian Jordan's body. Bruce, Brian's brother, accompanied the helicopter with his brother's body. Shortly after, Pippi hiked down to meet Carl Buckner and Steve Elner, and they all made their way back down to the valley. When Pippi arrived at the ranger station, Brian and Bruce's parents were there, which caused him to break down in tears. Mr. Jordan's attempt to comfort Pippi offered a little solace. Unaware of the specific events leading to the tragedy, the Jordans held Yosemite officials responsible for the disaster and questioned why hikers were allowed to climb Half Dome during the hazardous weather. Linda Crozier and another member of her party, Brian Gage, gave their statements to the rangers about what had occurred. Cage reflected on the accident, acknowledging it was a combination of mother nature and poor human judgment. Nevertheless, a potential wrongful death lawsuit against Yosemite loomed, with the ranger expressing concern that it could significantly impact the budget allocated for accessibility to Half Dome and other backcountry destinations. Cage was prepared to testify that the accident happened due to recklessness on the part of the five men in the cave. Esteban himself admitted that the Jordan's pursuit of a lawsuit would likely be dismissed, leading them to reconsider. He grappled with the guilt of causing the deaths of two people and injuring others, as well as the accusation from Rice that he had abandoned him. Esteban faced a difficult choice during the catastrophe, contemplating whether to risk his life to save someone else or to save himself and potentially let someone else perish. After fleeing the cave and surviving the incident with no major injuries, Esteban sank into a deep depression and was haunted by nightmares of Frith falling off the edge. Meanwhile, Tom Rice and Bruce Weiner were hospitalized at UC Davis Medical Center, both in critical condition. Weiner endured a challenging recovery with significant weight loss, muscle loss, and lingering nerve and kidney problems. More than 30 years later, Weiner remains deeply grateful to those who rescued them and cared for them during the hours until the helicopter arrived. 
He also acknowledged the reckless decision to seek refuge on the summit during a lightning storm, despite being inexperienced hikers. Rice, who spent weeks in the intensive care unit with severe leg burns, was resentful of Esteban's lack of injuries and criticized him for leaving. Nevertheless, he made a full recovery, and both Esteban and Rice returned to Half Dome the following summer to prove themselves. In conclusion, lightning is a significant danger during outdoor activities. Seek enclosed shelters and avoid contact with conducting objects during a storm. Large structures or cars can offer better protection than cliffs, caves, or trees. If caught in an open area, find the lowest point, crouch, and make yourself the smallest target possible. Descend quickly from high and exposed areas during a storm. Overall, understanding safety precautions and respecting the dangers of outdoor conditions can help prevent outdoor disasters such as this one on Half Dome in Yosemite National Park. Today, we delve into a captivating mystery surrounding British actor Julian Sands, an avid hiker and lover of the outdoors. It all started on a fateful Friday evening in the breathtaking Mount Baldy area, a rugged and challenging terrain, especially during winter conditions. Reported missing on January 13, 2023, by his wife at the age of 65, Julian Sands embarked on a solo hiking adventure heading towards the perilous Mount Baldy. The news of his disappearance sent the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Air Operation crews into action, tirelessly scouring the mountain as weather conditions permitted. His car was found at the Manker Flats trailhead area, adding to the puzzling nature of the case. For those unfamiliar with Julian Sands, he is renowned for his appearances in a variety of films, including classics like Room with a View, Arachnophobia, and Warlock. He has even portrayed diverse roles in television shows like 24, Smallville, and Banshee. As the search for Julian continued, the mountain itself has proven to be treacherous, with 14 rescue missions being undertaken by sheriff's officials, unfortunately resulting in loss of lives, including 56-year-old Crystal Gonzalez Landis, a devoted hiker and mother of four who tragically slid down Mount Baldy over 500 feet. Despite the risks and warnings, the allure of the outdoors still calls to adventurous souls. In the midst of this baffling disappearance, the San Gabriel Mountains have also been the focus of search efforts for the 61-year-old body of Bob Gregory of Hawthorne, California, yet another hiker who vanished without a trace. Now let's dive deeper into Julian Sand's illustrious career. Born on January 4, 1958, Julian's acting journey began in the early 80s and persisted until the very day that he vanished. His talent shone brightly in movies like The Killing Fields, Boxing Elena, Leaving Las Vegas, and A Room with a View. More recently, he was involved in Project Seneca, a film centered around the creation of earthquakes. Julian Sand's disappearance has garnered international attention with close friends like John Malkovich publicly expressing their concern and grief. The question lingers in everyone's mind, what could have happened to Julian Sands? Was it an unforeseen accident or something more enigmatic? As we explore the circumstances leading up to his disappearance, we must remain cautious, especially when venturing into challenging terrains like Mount Baldy, where nature can be both beautiful and unforgiving. Join us as we dive into this captivating case, analyzing every aspect of Julian Sands' life, his love for the outdoors, and what may have compelled him to take on the majestic Mount Baldy. So grab your hiking gear and let's embark on this captivating journey together. Julian Sands, a man who truly embraced the great outdoors and physical activity. For Julian, hiking was not just a hobby, it was a way to hit the reset button and find balance amid the demands of his profession. In his own words, he declared, I'm happiest being close to the mountain summit on a glorious cold morning. But what made this particular morning different from the rest? Before delving deeper into Julian's disappearance, let's first explore the majestic Mount Baldy and the San Bernardino mountain area. Gaining an understanding of the challenges both Julian and the search and rescue teams faced. Mount Baldy, Though a popular destination for outdoor enthusiasts, has a dark and unfortunate past, having claimed the lives of many hikers over the years. 
News reports have often highlighted the dangers of this mountain, and Julian is not the first to vanish without a trace. Unfortunately, others before him have met similar fates, some found deceased with injuries ranging from falls to exposure, while others have never been located or ever seen again. Situated in the San Gabriel Mountains of San Bernardino County, California, Mount Baldy is surrounded by a picturesque national forest. The area boasts a rich history dating back a century, with various tales to be told, but we will focus on the key elements of the Julian Sands case for now. The climate on Mount Baldy exhibits extremes, with temperatures plummeting to negative 10 degrees during cooler months and soaring close to 100 degrees in the warmer ones. Annual snowfall ranges between 50 to 60 inches, accompanied by frequent precipitation. Despite its challenges, Mount Baldy remains open year-round and attracts thousands of visitors each season. The mountain offers a range of hikes to suit diverse preferences and skills. Among the popular trails are the 10-mile Bridge to Nowhere and East Fork Trail, the 1.5-mile San Antonio Falls Trail, the 11-mile Mount Baldy Notch Trail, and the 12-mile Icehouse Canyon to the Cucamonga Peak Trail, to name just a few. These hikes vary in difficulty, from easy strolls to advanced treks, appealing to hikers of all types. While the specific trail Sands chose is not mentioned in the search and rescue details, it is likely he opted for the Mount Baldy Summit Trail. This trail, considered the easiest route to the peak at an impressive 10,069 feet in elevation, starts at the top of Notch Restaurant and follows the Devil's Backbone, spanning approximately seven miles round trip with an elevation gain of 2,200 feet. Alternatively, some hikers opt for the service road from the ski area parking lot to the top of Notch Restaurant, a shorter six mile option with a more strenuous elevation gain of 3,500 feet. Reaching the summit offers a breathtaking reward, a vast, flat, and treeless panoramic view of Southern California's cities, deserts, mountains, and oceans, which aptly earns the mountain its name, Mount Baldy. Given Julian's adventurous spirit, he may have taken a more challenging route to the summit, but specific details to support this theory remain elusive. The search and rescue effort focused on the location where he was last seen, leaving us wondering what they had to say about the circumstances of his disappearance. Let's delve deeper into the surrounding geography, as it plays a crucial role in understanding the challenges Julian faced. The vast Angeles National Forest, spanning approximately 700,000 acres, engulfs the San Gabriel and the Sierra Polona Mountains. Established in 1908, this national forest primarily lies within LA County, with a small portion extending into southwestern San Bernardino County. With this expanse, one can find several nationally designated wilderness areas, each with its unique charm. The Cucamonga Wilderness, the Magic Mountain Wilderness, Pleasant View Ridge Wilderness, the San Gabriel Wilderness, and Sheep Mountains Wilderness. With so much wilderness to explore, one can easily see how it can be easy to get lost in this vast and beautiful landscape. A significant factor in Julian's case was the weather. As mentioned earlier, the conditions in January were far from favorable. The winter season in the area can be harsh, with powerful storms battering the region one after the other, bringing severe winter weather. Unfortunately, it so happened that Julian entered the park during one of the most challenging times of the year, making the search effort even more complicated. The search effort was massive and involved the collaboration of hundreds of professional search and rescue personnel from various agencies, making it one of the largest search operations in modern times. Agencies like the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department, Fontana Sheriff Station, West Valley Search and Rescue Division, the California Highway Patrol, local and state law enforcement, and park officials all came together to coordinate the first round of searches. Initially, the focus was on the Mount Baldy area, but as time went on, the search zone expanded to include surrounding trails and wilderness areas within the Angeles National Forest. 
Searchers attempted to narrow down their efforts by focusing on a specific area of the trail where the California Highway Patrol's RICO device indicated a possible electronic signal during the early days of the investigation. Julian's silver Volvo was found at the trailhead, covered in a thin layer of snow, suggesting that it had been sitting untouched for several days by that point. However, there were no clues inside the vehicle to indicate what might have happened to Julian and everything appeared to be in order. Despite the dedication and the use of technology such as canines, helicopters, drones with FLIR technology, the search efforts were continuously hampered by relentless winter storms, forcing operations to halt for days at a time. On February 25th, a month after Julian's disappearance, the search effort was scaled back due to lack of leads, limited resources, and the persistent winter weather. The heartbreaking realization that the effort had to shift from a rescue to a recovery operation weighed heavily on everyone involved, including Julian's friends and family, who were holding on to hope for his safe return. Regrettably, Julian's case is not an isolated incident. Over the years, since 2020, more than 100 search operations have been conducted for missing hikers on Mount Baldy, resulting in six confirmed fatalities as of February 2023. This somber statistic paints an even darker picture of the treacherous winter conditions that plagued the mountain at the start of each new year. As we continue our exploration, we must now consider the possibilities of what occurred in the vast wilderness of Mount Baldy during those winter days. The challenges posed by the environment and the history of previous missing hikers serves as a reminder of the perils that can befall even the most experienced adventurers in this breathtaking yet unforgivable landscape. Let us proceed with caution and empathy as we seek to uncover the truth behind Julian Sands' enigmatic disappearance amidst the stunning but unpredictable wilderness of Mount Baldy. According to the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department, Julian was one of three hikers who went missing in the Mount Baldy area during the month of January. Jin Chung, a 75-year-old man from North Hollywood, was reported missing on Sunday, January 22nd, after his hike at Mount Baldy. Fortunately, he was found safe a few days later, although he did suffer from some weather-related injuries. On January 18th, another hiker, 61-year-old Robert Gregory from Hawthorne, California went missing after failing to return home from his hike near Mount Islip, located in the Angeles National Forest. Sadly, Mr. Gregory's body was discovered exactly one month later, on February 18th, approximately 300 feet below the summit of Mount Islip. Even for the experienced outdoor enthusiast, Mount Baldy can prove to be treacherous and yield disastrous results if not properly prepared. The dangers that lurk on the mountain should serve as a stern reminder of the importance of adequate preparation and caution. Unfortunately, despite these dangers, the allure of the outdoors and the spirit of adventure will likely continue to draw people to explore the wilderness. One possible scenario that comes to mind about Julian Sands' disappearance, albeit an unfortunate one, is the kind we fear but anticipate given the history of accidents on Mount Baldy. It is not difficult to imagine a similar scenario playing out for Julian, as it takes just one wrong move or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Julian could have suffered a fall, leaving him trapped or incapacitated. The weather on January 13th did not offer much forgiveness, with temperatures ranging from the upper 40s during the day to freezing at night, accompanied by high winds, sleet, and snow. Hypothermia from exposure could have been a significant risk. But if that were the case, why were the searchers unable to find him? In such situations, when a person becomes injured or exposed to the elements, they often get disoriented, losing their sense of direction. Lost hikers can end up in areas that seem to defy logic, straying completely off course from their intended routes. Dehydration sets in over time, leading individuals to make poor decisions out of desperation, much like those lost at sea who may drink seawater or attempt to reach an imaginary island caused by a mirage. In the wilderness, a similar phenomenon can occur in an emergency situation, with people wandering into oblivion, eventually being swallowed up by the unforgiving wilderness.
Although animal predation is possible, there is no evidence to suggest that it played a role in Julian's disappearance. Mount Baldy is not excessively tall, and predators like mountain lions are more likely to be seen in lower elevations during colder months in search of food. Nonetheless, the rugged environment of Mount Baldy poses enough natural dangers, and Julian's case serves as a stark reminder of the importance of preparation and respect for nature's unpredictability. Another less explored scenario revolves around the potential of foul play. While it may seem far-fetched, we have all heard the disturbing stories of obsessed fans fixated on their favorite celebrities. Although Julian's disappearance might not have been linked to such a scenario, we cannot dismiss the possibility of encountering individuals with sinister intentions in remote areas. Alternatively, it could have been a simple exchange gone awry, or Julian might have unintentionally angered someone else on the trail. In the past, unfortunate accidents have occurred due to carelessness, as seen in the 2007 incident where a hiker's life was lost due to rocks tossed carelessly down a mountain, oblivious to those below. Delving into Julian's personal life, it is worth considering whether he might have been experiencing deeper personal struggles that were unknown to the public. Although he enjoyed a successful acting career, could he have felt stagnant or unfulfilled? The stresses of an ever-changing industry might have led him to seek solace in the outdoors, as he often did to balance his professional life. Nonetheless, such feelings can pass with time, but for some, they may prove overwhelming. At times, the allure of escape can be strangely appealing, but I don't imply that Julian had any desire to disappear. We can't ignore the possibility as we've seen in other cases where individuals sought such an escape. While I personally do not believe this scenario in Julian's case, it is essential to explore every angle to uncover the truth. The events leading up to his disappearance remain a mystery, making it difficult to determine exactly what transpired on that day. However, something tells me that the answers we seek may not be too far away, and perhaps once found, we'll realize the clues were right in front of us all along. Intriguingly, overconfidence could be a factor worth considering. Oftentimes, we hear stories of experienced outdoor enthusiasts who, despite their familiarity with the area, bite off more than they can chew. Positive experiences on previous trips may not guarantee the same outcome on subsequent ones. Hence, it is essential to remain vigilant and prepared, even in familiar territories. In the case of Julian's disappearance, we cannot help but feel that this case is shrouded in uncertainty, much like the enigmatic persona of Julian himself. Apart from the myriad roles he portrayed in the illustrious career that he had, Julian was captivating in his own right. Many were drawn to his charisma, wisdom, kindness, and friendship. Yet, despite his admirable qualities, Julian remained somewhat of a mystery, concealing aspects of himself from the world. On June 24th, 2023, the news of Julian Sands' tragic end has deeply saddened the world. A body discovered in the wilderness near Mount Baldy, California, has now been officially confirmed to be that of the missing British actor. After transporting the body to the coroner's office for identification, the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department released a statement stating that the body had been positively identified as Julian Sands, the 65-year-old actor. The search for Julian Sands had been a coordinated effort by the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department with Mount Baldy's challenging terrain in the San Gabriel Mountains, providing to be a formidable obstacle for rescuers. The inclement weather hampered the ground searches, causing delays and difficulty in finding Sands. Despite the effort of over 80 people in a renewed search on the 17th of June, they were unable to locate him. Consequently, the Sheriff's Office made the difficult decision to scale back the search. Julian Sands' family, in their first statement in four months, expressed their profound gratitude to the search teams and spoke of their enduring love for the actor, remembering him as a wonderful father, husband, explorer, and lover of the natural wonder and of the arts. John Malkovich, a close friend of Julian Sands for four decades since they met on the set of The Killing Fields in 1983, paid a heartfelt tribute to him. As their film Seneca on the creation of earthquakes premiered at the Berlin Film Festival in February, Malkovich expressed his deep affection for Sands and the tremendous loss felt by all who knew him. 
He described Sands as exceptionally clever and an exceptional storyteller, adding that their friendship allowed them to talk about anything with each other. Julian Sands was not only known for his talent and versatility as an actor, but also cherished for his engaging personality, sense of humor, and ability to connect with others. As the world mourns the loss of this exceptional individual, we remember him for the impact he left on the lives of those who were fortunate enough to know him. May his memory live on, and may he continue to inspire us through his contributions to the arts and the enduring connections he forged with his loved ones and friends. If you've enjoyed this content from a universe of mystery, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my new and upcoming content. The search continues for a former Grand Valley State University. Colin Finnerty hasn't been seen in a couple Dozens days. Dozens of people and also canine units have just been scouring this area looking for any It was last sign seen about 8.30 that night. going on right now, but the weather is hampering. Finnerty was not research. familiar with the area. No unclear what may have happened. Colin Finnerty is possible. So far, though, point. search crews have found nothing. Welcome back to A Universe of Mystery. Today, we'll dive into a story of triumph, tragedy, and the enduring mystery of a man named Cullen Finnerty. Cullen was an extraordinary individual, known widely for his prowess on the football field, but today we dive deeper, beyond the accolades, into the heart of his life's journey. Cullen Finnerty was born on August 18, 1982, in Brighton, Michigan. His early life was marked by an unwavering commitment to football. At Brighton High School, he started making a name for himself, winning the Livingston County Football Player of the Year Award as a senior and being named to the Ann Arbor News All-Area First Team. Even then, his talent was indisputable. After redshirting his first year at the University of Toledo, Cullen transferred to Grand Valley State University, where he would become a football legend. It was at Grand Valley State that Cullen had led his team to win the NCAA Division II football championships in 2003, 2005, and 2006, becoming one of the most successful quarterbacks in college football history. Each game, each season, further solidified his place in the NCAA Division II history. On Memorial Day weekend, we always go to Baldwin, which is where my parents have a cabin and it's just a time to relax, spend time with my side of the family. In the weeks leading up to their trip, Finnerty complained of headaches and restless sleep. He was using oxycodone for his back pain. On Sunday, May 26, 2013, he asked his wife to drop him off at Bray Creek State Forest Campground for a solo fishing trip. 35 minutes later, at dusk, he called his wife in a panic. He was uh, disoriented. He didn't know where he was in the woods. He was afraid. I just knew when I spoke with him that something wasn't right. Colin Finnery said he ran into two men on Baldwin River. He thought they might be following him. He was lost, scared, and confused. So we looked in the woods all evening. It was getting, you know, darker fast. And so I called the police to, to see if they could help us find him. At 9.36 p.m., Finnerty made another call that lasted just 20 seconds. He told his brother-in-law, I don't know where I am. By Monday morning, helicopters hovered above the 16 square miles of forest. Search and rescue dogs searched the brush. We went over to the campground where he went missing. We fully expected Cullen to show up. He was tough, he, he, he could take care of himself, even in the woods. All of us had our own idea of what he might have done. Maybe he took off and he was hiding or, or he, was, he was lost and didn't know where he was. Another night passed with no sign of Finnerty. Grand Valley State University sent a busload of coaches, players, and staff to look for Finnerty. By then, nearly 40 officers and hundreds of volunteers were scouring the woods. After 24 hours, Cullen's friends, family, and searchers became concerned for his safety. While searching the forest, Cullen's friend, Kurt Ains, another former GVSU quarterback, and his wife came to a clearing where Kurt's wife yelled, oh my God, I think I found him. The location confused Kurt because of how close the road was to his final location. It was so close he could hear the traffic. This was also only about four tenths of a mile from where he made his final phone call. He was found face down, still wearing his waders and his fishing vest. Everyone was in disbelief. Police ruled out foul play. 
The initial autopsy was unable to determine the cause of death. In search of an explanation, the Finnerty family looked back to his past. Finnerty's brain was sent to Boston University to determine whether he suffered from CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a degenerative brain disease caused by repeated head drama common in football players. When the results came in, it was found that Finnerty was a stage 2 out of 4 for CTE, so he had the disease for a few years. The disease advanced in his brain even after he had stopped playing. However, family and friends dispute the idea that his brain was damaged or that he had any kind of dementia. No one saw any signs of that. But experts agree that CTE doesn't start with just one hit to the head. However, Finnerty only had one diagnosed concussion in his career. Although it's impossible to connect having stage 2 CTE to the series of circumstances surrounding his death, doctors agree it may have played a role. An updated autopsy determined that Finnerty died from pneumonia and inhaled his own vomit after he became disoriented. Colin Finnerty's story is one of triumph, resilience, and an indomitable spirit. A man who rose from a small town in Michigan to the heights of college football, leaving an indelible mark on everyone who knew him, watched him, and cheered for him. A Colin story is also a reminder of the very human cost of the sports we love. The hidden struggles that often go unnoticed until it's too late. His untimely death sent shockwaves to the world of football and beyond, prompting a deeper examination of the sport's impact on its players. His legacy, however, lives on. Every pass thrown on the football fields of Grand Valley State University echoes with the memory of Cohen's powerful arm. Every victory achieved carries the spirit of the winningest quarterback in NCAA history. The echoes of his name, the memories of his achievements, and the lessons from his life continue to inspire future generations of athletes. His family, his friends, his fans, they remember him not for just the records he set or the games he won, but for the man he was. A devoted son, a loving husband, a fantastic father, a loyal friend. Cullen's wife, Jennifer, and their two children lost more than a football legend. They lost a loving husband and father. His parents, Tim and Maureen, lost their son. But in their loss, they have found the strength and the love and support of the community, the fans, and all who knew and admired Cullen. In the face of their grief, they have chosen to honor Cullen's memory by raising awareness about CTE and the risk associated with contact sports. Their courage serves as a beacon for other families navigating similar tragedies. If you've enjoyed this content from Universe of Mystery, please like, share, and subscribe. It really helps the channel. And hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. In the realm of the mysterious and secluded, Keith Reinhardt, a sports writer with aspirations of becoming a novelist, yearned for a break from the fast-paced world of a Chicago newspaper. Introduced to the enigmatic town of Silver Plume, Colorado, by an old acquaintance, Keith saw it as an ideal haven to embark on a sabbatical and breathe life into the novel that had always lingered in his dreams. Taking a leave of absence from his job and persuading his wife to grant him his venture, Keith set out on a three-month retreat in this remote town, nestled amidst the mystifying peaks of the Rocky Mountains. Anticipating a transformative journey of self-discovery, Keith was drawn into a perplexing enigma that unfolded before him. Inspired by the tale of a man named Tom Young, who had mysteriously vanished a year prior, Keith's quest to unravel the truth took an unforeseen turn. As he delved deeper into the narrative, Keith unwittingly stumbled upon a clandestine secret, one that would ultimately intertwine with his own disappearance, leaving behind a haunting puzzle that tormented the inhabitants of Silver Plume and forever haunted his loved ones. Today, we embark on a journey into the realm of two inexplicable disappearances, one that eventually finds resolution and another that remains shrouded in impenetrable darkness. Now, let us delve into the disappearance of Keith Reinhardt. Silver Plume, Colorado, a place that epitomizes the essence of a small town hidden away in the heart of nature's embrace. Nestled in Clear Creek County, among the towering peaks of the Rocky Mountains, Silver Plume stands as a former mining settlement steeped in tumultuous history. Once home to over 2,000 inhabitants, it was ravaged by a cataclysmic fire and a devastating avalanche, coupled with the passing of new legislation that gradually thinned the town's population. 
Though a few steadfast individuals remain, by the late 1980s, Silver Plume numbered just over 100 souls. Presently, that count has crept closer to 200, yet it remains far from leaving its mark on the world. With its tranquil existence cradled within the Clear Creek Valley, life in Silver Plume exudes serenity and an unhurried pace. UncoverColorado.com aptly describes it as living in a ghost town, where only a handful of businesses adorn the main street. However, visitors are not drawn to Silver Plume for its commercial offerings. Instead, the alert lies in the boundless opportunities for hiking, fishing, skiing, and other outdoor adventures that call those who crave the challenge of the untamed mountains. Situated at an elevation exceeding 9,000 feet, Silver Plume offers a hiatus for those seeking solace from the noise of modern existence. And for Keith Reinhardt, it was precisely this isolation and tranquility that enticed him. Keith had lived a hectic life, toiling for 22 years in the newspaper industry, primarily as a sports writer for the Daily Herald in Arlington Heights, Illinois, a suburb a mere 26 miles from the bustling metropolis of Chicago. At age 49, Keith experienced what some might term as a midlife crisis, a critical juncture that prompted introspection about his accomplishments and the dreams he had left unfulfilled. Having recently married Carolyn, his wife, and a proud father to three children from a previous marriage, Keith sought more from life, yearning for the adventures and possibilities that seemed to have eluded him with the passage of time. One of his aspirations was to author a novel, a lifelong dream that he felt compelled to pursue before it slipped away forever. Enter Ted Parker, proprietor of KP Cafe in Silver Plume, an old friend of Keith's. Through the conversation, Keith confided in Ted about the overwhelming stress of his frenzied existence, the weight of his age, and his desire to shed a few pounds and regain his vitality. Intrigued by the prospect of Silver Plume, a place offering a break from the chaos, Ted painted an enticing picture of a slower pace, a less hurried environment, the perfect sanctuary for a novelist seeking solitude and inspiration. For Keith, the decision to embark on this journey was relatively straightforward. He would retreat to Silver Plume, devoting a few months to writing, rejuvenating his spirit, and perhaps even exploring the majestic mountains that surrounded the town. However, convincing his wife, Carolyn, proved to be a daunting task. She harbored concerns about Keith's decision to distance himself from everything, including his family, in the pursuit of his dream. Yet, she did not wish to impede his journey or hold him back from the neglected aspirations that had long haunted him. After numerous conversations, some persuasion, and Keith's assurance that his absence would be temporary, Carolyn reluctantly consented. In fact, Keith proposed that once he had settled in Silver Plume, Carolyn could join him immersing herself in the unique experience the town had to offer. Keith secured a three-month leave of absence from the Daily Herald, and with plans taking shape, he made preparations to venture into the heart of Silver Plume. Uncertain about lodging and financial obligations, Keith became aware, likely through Ted Parker, that an adjacent building to the KP Cafe stood vacant, awaiting a new tenant. Recognizing an opportunity, Keith leased the space, envisioning a small antique shop that would sustain him financially while providing ample time for his writing. Packing his belongings and acquiring a new computer for his creative endeavors, Keith set off on his adventure. Little did he know that the very building he had chosen would unleash an inescapable wellspring of inspiration. Arriving in Silver Plume that summer, Keith discovered that Ted's descriptions had not exaggerated the allure of this quaint town. Despite the challenges of running his struggling antique shop, which failed to attract significant business, like most enterprises in Silver Plume, Keith remained undeterred. Conversely, his attempts at novel writing yielded meager results, with his gaze fixed upon a flashing cursor. In a world devoid of validation for the various theories surrounding Tom Young's fate, and with little confirmation about his intentions and travels, Keith Reinhardt persisted in his quest to write his novel and uncover the truth behind its enigmatic inspiration. However, as Keith delved deeper into his investigation, the mystery reached an unexpected resolution of sorts. On July 31st, two hunters stumbled upon a discerning scene in the mountains, a man's skeletal remains propped against a tree, accompanied by the skeletal remains of a dog. Promptly notifying the sheriff's department, the hunters guided them to the site, where forensic examination revealed that the remains had been there for approximately a year. Both the man and the dog displayed gunshot wounds to their skulls. Nearby, authorities discovered a backpack and a revolver. 
Subsequent forensic analysis confirmed the identity of the man as Tom Young and suggested that the gunshot may have been self-inflicted. The presence of the gun near the scene seemingly supported the conclusion of suicide, leading authorities to believe that Young's supposed plans to travel to Europe were merely a cover story. However, despite the official ruling, the people of Silver Plume harbored doubts. Some speculated that Tom may have encountered someone in the mountains who wrestled the gun from him and pulled the trigger. The fact that his loyal canine companion, Gus, also met a tragic end made it difficult for them to accept that Tom willingly would harm Gus rather than leave him behind. Nevertheless, law enforcement treated the case as a closed suicide, despite inconclusive ballistic tests linking the bullets to the gun found at the scene. While Keith Reinhardt initially found himself increasingly engrossed in the story, his own involvement took an abrupt and mysterious turn. Just a week after the discovery of Young's remains and the official ruling, Keith vanished, triggering one of the most perplexing mysteries and intensive search efforts ever witnessed in Colorado. Throughout the week following Young's discovery, Keith continued to inquire about him, simultaneously working on his novel. Curiously, Keith attended a party the night before his disappearance where he spoke about West Virginia and expressed a desire to visit the state. The identity of a woman Keith conversed with at the party, known only as Greta or Gretchen, remained unknown, as did the content of their conversation. The following day, on the evening of August 7th, Keith left his antique shop, locked the door behind him, and strolled through town, informing acquaintances of his intention to hike up Mount Pendleton, a daring feat considering the late hour and the six-hour trek required. Most dismissed his plans as mere bravado, given his lack of supplies, appropriate clothing, and experience navigating the treacherous terrain. A sighting of Keith occurred around 4.30 p.m. as he headed toward the mountain, with his last official sighting placing him in front of the Buckley's General Store at 5.05 p.m. Here, he purchased a soft drink. Keith had informed friends that he would return around 10 o'clock p.m., a statement that defied logic unless he had no intention of attempting the mountain ascent. Concern mounted when Keith failed to open his shop the following morning, as the building's owner, Ted Parker, entered Keith's living area only to discover no sign of his presence. A newspaper lay beside Keith's computer, open to an article about Tom Young's remains. Strangely, Keith's unfinished novel remained on the computer, with its final lines deepening the mystery and heightening the concern for Keith's safety. Despite an exhaustive search involving helicopters, volunteers, search and rescue teams, tracking dogs, and law enforcement, encompassing over 125 searchers and more than 10,000 man-hours, no trace of Keith was found, not even a fragment of clothing. The search was ultimately called off, leaving behind a vast wilderness where a single man could easily vanish. Keith's sudden disappearance, compared with the unsolved mystery surrounding Tom Young, left the Clear Creek County Sheriff's Department puzzled and grieving loved ones struggling to comprehend the circumstances. With little to go on in terms of clues or possessions, Keith's family vehemently dismissed the notion of him voluntarily abandoning his wife and children to start anew. Instead, they grappled with the belief that something went awry that fateful night in the forest. Despite the extensive searches, the vast expanse of natural wonder rendered it all too easy to overlook a solitary man lost amidst the majestic landscape. His daughter Tiffany, however, held a different perspective, suggesting that writers often immerse themselves in the stories that they write to better understand them. She proposed the idea that her father may have wanted to experience the act of disappearing firsthand to entice his writing. This belief was somewhat prevalent at the time, although with more than 30 years having passed, it seems unlikely that Keats' intention was to disappear permanently. Unless, of course, something went wrong that night in the forest, rendering him unable to return. One of Keats' sons believed that foul play must have been involved in his father's disappearance. He found it highly improbable that Keith, a devoted family man, would willingly abandon his loved ones. He later climbed the Pendleton Mountain, experiencing the emotional weight of being in the same place where his father had vanished or potentially still remains. Despite exhaustive efforts, including raising awareness, distributing flyers, appearing on national television shows, and consulting psychics, Keats' family was unable to uncover any new information or clues about his fate. Eventually, a plaque bearing a poem written by Keith was placed on the mountain as a marker and a memorial for the man who never returned to the town that inspired him. 
For the people of Silver Plume, Keith Reinhardt's disappearance became an enduring enigma. The coincidence of both Keith and Tom Young leasing the same building and meeting their respective fates in the surrounding mountains was too striking to dismiss. Some individuals in the town refused to accept the official ruling on Tom Young's death, let alone comprehend Keith's mysterious vanishing. The unidentified woman Keith was seen talking to at the party added another layer of intrigue. The nature of their conversation, if it held any secrets at all, remains unknown. The story possessed all the elements of mystery and intrigue that could captivate any novelist seeking to craft a compelling tale. However, in this case, the novel would forever remain unfinished, perpetuating the haunting mystery of what happened to Keith Reinhardt. Over the years, various theories have emerged ranging from the possibility that Keith encountered an accident, succumbed to exposure, or fell victim to wildlife predators in the vast wilderness of Colorado. Others speculate that Keith orchestrated his own disappearance, seeking a fresh start away from the busyness and stress of his old regular life. Some even suggest that Keith and Tom Young stumbled upon something or someone in the mountain that posed a threat, leading to their respective fates. Presently, Keith would be turning 82 years old, but his whereabouts remains unknown. Desperate hopes linger within his family, yearning for answers regarding his fate. Despite the passage of time, the unresolved mystery continues to haunt everyone involved. Keith's disappearance represents a disconcerting case that evokes contemplation, a writer becoming lost in his own work to the extent of becoming part of it. The convergence of two men residing in the same space and experiencing similar outcomes and the sorrow of an individual searching for them only to vanish without a trace. While some view Keats' disappearance as an inexplicable enigma, others interpret it as a clear-cut case of an inexperienced hiker lost in the unforgiving wilderness of Colorado. Regardless of perspective, the fact remains that a family lost a father and a husband, leaving behind a void that perpetuates this sad and perplexing mystery. Three main theories have emerged over the years, progressing from the least plausible to the most likely. The first proposed that both Keith Reinhardt and Tom Young encountered someone or something on the mountain that led to their murders. However, the lack of evidence and the extensive search efforts conducted by numerous individuals in the area diminish the credibility of this theory. Another possibility is that Keith staged his own disappearance, intending to embark on a new life elsewhere. While understandable, considering his struggles and aspirations, the absence of any trace or activity from Keith in the years following his vanishing makes this theory less tenable. Lastly, it is plausible that Keith and Tom Young simply stumbled upon something or someone that posed a threat, leading to their respective fates. However, the absence of concrete evidence or substantial clues makes it challenging to support this theory definitively. The mysterious woman Keith was seen conversing with at the party remains an intriguing aspect of the case. However, without further information, it is difficult to ascertain her role or the significance of their discussion. Despite the numerous theories, the story of Keith Reinhardt's disappearance remains shrouded in uncertainty and speculation. Ultimately, the truth eludes us, and the haunting mystery of Keith's fate endures, leaving his family and those invested in the case yearning for resolution. The tale of a man vanishing and then disappearing himself is reminiscent of something that one would encounter in a movie. It possesses substantial material for those inclined to delve into, yet ultimately relies on conjecture and speculation. The allure lies in its mystery, but when reality seeps into the narrative, its appeal diminishes. Did Keith truly abandon his family, wife, job, and entire life to embark on a risky venture of starting anew? It takes a certain kind of person, and not in a positive sense, to accomplish such a feat. A person devoid of conscience, or with a blunted sense of it. This characterization doesn't seem to align with Keats' personality. Furthermore, we must consider Keats' aspirations to complete his cherished novel. Would he have forsaken this dream along with everything else? It appears illogical to me. Instead, it seems more plausible that he ventured into the same area where Tom Young was found to seek further inspiration in the forest and on the mountains. However, Keith's lack of experience, equipment, and planning might have resulted in a disastrous outcome. Now let's explore the final theory. If you have never hiked in a densely wooded and mountainous area, you cannot comprehend the overwhelming nature of it. Having lived in the mountains myself, I frequently hear stories in the news about individuals, even experienced hikers, getting lost in nearby parks and forests. When disoriented and uncertain of one's path, panic sets in, intensifying as daylight fades. 
Today, most people bring GPS units, weapons, and communication devices, although the wilderness often hampers cell phone signals. In contrast, Keith set off from Silver Plume with nothing but the clothes on his back and perhaps a can of soda. These preparations are insufficient for a nighttime hike into the mountains, even for a seasoned hiker familiar with the area. Keith's background suggests that he was a city person working in the Chicago suburbs without prior experience in such endeavors. The mountains of Clear Creek County host several predators, including black bears, bobcats, elk, and mountain lions. Considering the isolated location and the dense forest cover, it is plausible that their numbers are higher than in more frequented areas. Search teams describe the area as perilous, with sharp slopes, rocks, and treacherous cliffs. One can easily envision Keith getting injured or even killed by wildlife or the hazardous terrain. In darkness, the chances of survival diminish further. The search for Keith was akin to searching for a needle in a haystack, assuming he was still alive. If he had fallen into a cavern or off a cliff, locating him would have been nearly impossible. He might have been unconscious, tucked away in a remote and obscure spot within the vast expanse. The lack of supplies also impeded his ability to leave behind any trace. Although I'm drawn to the intrigue of a compelling mystery, this particular case seems more focused on perpetuating a legend than confronting the probable reality. For law enforcement, search teams, and many who have scrutinized the case, the likelihood of Keith returning on his own after venturing into the wilderness at night is slim. The disappearance of Keith Reinhardt represents a sorrowful tale of a man's quest to find himself, resulting in the loss of everything. For some, it will always revolve around foul play, despite the absence of evidence. While it cannot be definitively ruled out, for others, it serves as a cautionary tale about the perils of venturing into the wilderness unprepared and inexperienced. Even after 30 years, Keith's family continues to wonder what became of him. While there is a glimmer of hope that answers may surface someday, the realization remains that the forest might conceal dark secrets. After three decades, if Keith did enter into the forest and became lost, injured, or met an untimely end, there may be little, if anything, left to discover. If you've enjoyed this content from Universe of Mystery, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my new content. On April 6, 2017, 22-year-old Jacob Gray went missing while traveling on the Salduk Hot Springs Road in the Olympic National Park of Washington State. His whereabouts remain unknown until August 10, 2018 when his body was discovered in Hole Lake, located within the Daniel J. Evans Wilderness area of the park. The location was 15 miles away from his belongings and at an elevation of 5,300 feet. This is the story of Jacob Gray. Jacob Gray, a native of Santa Cruz, California, embarked on a solo bicycle trip from Port Townsend, Washington on April 5, 2017, hauling a fully loaded trailer of camping equipment. His ultimate destination was the Daniel J. Evans Wilderness and Olympic National Park in Washington before continuing eastward. However, on April 6th, Gray's bicycle, trailer, and most of his belongings were found approximately six and a half miles up Saul Duke Hot Springs Road, a picturesque route named after the Indian term for sparkling waters. An unusual discovery was made. A bow was lying on the ground and arrows were embedded in the ground and protruding from the back of the trailer but there was no sign of the bike's owner. Jacob Gray's bicycle had a unique backstory. It was a promotional bike won by his father, Randy, at a contractor show. As the son of a house builder, Gray was skilled with a saw and constructed a plywood rack behind the seat to secure two milk crates side by side. The bike's flat pedals were suitable for his running shoes or hiking boots. And while it wasn't built for speed or looks, it was practical and efficient, much like a pickup truck. When it came to camping gear, Gray had a preferred shopping destination, the Goodwill store in Port Townsend, Washington. There, he gathered the items for his journey. Despite the harsh weather conditions that characterized northwestern Washington in the early days of April, Jacob, a skilled surfer who had grown up on the beach, remained undeterred. He had a deep connection with the water, which energized him in all its forms, whether he was surfing on it or simply swimming in it. According to his father, Randy, Jacob's love for the water had been cultivated from a young age, and it was evident in the way he fearlessly rode the waves, regardless of weather conditions. 
Despite the challenges posed by the harsh weather, Jacob's enthusiasm for his trip remained unwavering. There were a few reported sightings of Jacob, but they were not very helpful in locating him. However, some of the sightings seemed credible. For instance, a man claimed to have seen Jacob twice in Indian Valley and along Crescent Lake on April 5th. The next day, a woman reported seeing a man towing a red trailer climbing Fairholme until 1 o'clock in the morning. Later that same morning, another woman passed Jacob as he was riding up the Salduk Hot Springs Road, which was about two miles from the 101. Later that afternoon, the same woman noticed Jacob's rig on the side of the road, which was six and a half miles upriver from the 101. She was curious enough to snap a quick photo of the abandoned contraption, which was a flash of red and yellow against the green of the forest. However, it wasn't a good place to camp or stash a bike for long, as it was highly visible, not 10 yards from the road and only 20 yards from the river. Despite these sightings, Jacob's whereabouts remain unknown. A ranger had recalled seeing the bike in gear, but didn't think much of it, assuming that the rider was on a short excursion on foot. This wasn't uncommon in the area, since touring cyclists were a common sight, and Jacob was the first of many to come. It was evident that someone, possibly Jacob, had been organizing gear, as there was a poly top spread out surrounded by camping equipment. However, what caught the ranger's attention were four arrows stuck in the ground in an east-west line near the tarp. While going missing isn't a crime or an emergency for individuals over the age of 18, a person isn't considered missing until someone reports them as such. In this case, nobody had reported Jacob missing at all. It was rare for a cyclist to vanish, unlike hikers and runners. However, the fact that the bike remained untouched for most of the day piqued the ranger's curiosity. On the afternoon of April 6th, Ranger John Bowie searched the area around the bike, hoping to find any clues. He wondered if the cyclist had gone to the river to filter some water or hitchhike to the hot springs. But if he had slipped and fallen into the sub-40 degree weather, he would surely have succumbed to the elements. The following is the actual missing persons dispatch call to park rangers. Dispatch, 741 Ron on North Point. 741 Ron. I've got a bicycle that has went off the Salduck Road about uh, mile marker 7, and I can't find anybody around it. You might want to send a ranger up here so we can see what's going on. Copy, thanks for the info. 1630. 741 Ron, 611. 741 Ron. Is that way? Is that bicycle down the bank a ways, or is it easy to get to? It's easy to get to. It's got a little carrot on the back of it, too. It looked like it crashed off the road. Okay, so it didn't look like maybe somebody hit there so they can go off the hike. It doesn't look like anybody's hit it. It looks like he just went off the road. Um, I'm going to stay here until you get up this way. Okay, I'll be coming over from the Ella. 741 When Ranger Bowie stumbled upon the bike and trailer, his heart sank as he feared the worst. However, to his relief, they were in excellent condition, fully operational with no signs of damage or malfunction. The trailer was loaded with a ton of equipment, which indicated that the owner had come fully prepared for his adventure. Despite the reassuring state of the bike and trailer, the rangers couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling that something wasn't right. Their worst fears were confirmed when they scoured the Saul Duck Hot Springs Resort and no one had seen the owner. They suspected that he may have fallen into the river, but they had to keep searching to be sure. On that fateful Friday, Ranger Ray stumbled upon Jacob's wallet, ID, and a list of phone numbers. It confirmed the owner's identity, but it also heightened their concern for his safety. Ray immediately contacted Jacob's sister, Mallory, and upon hearing the news, she implored Ray to call their parents in Santa Cruz right away, hoping they could help in the search and bring Jacob home safely. 
All signs seem to point to the river as the likely location of Jacob's disappearance. The Olympic National Park rangers concluded that he may have slipped and fallen into the water while trying to filter it into his camelback. They planned to search the river more thoroughly when the water levels went down in the summer. Jacob's mother, Laura, had spoken to him just a few nights before he set out on his journey. She knew that he was excited to embark on a cross-country tour to visit his brother in Vermont. Jacob had even mentioned that he might take two years to complete the trip, working on jobs and seasonal work along the way. When Jacob's mother reached out to the rangers for help, they explained that their park was extremely understaffed and overburdened. The park covered an area that was 200,000 acres larger than Yosemite and received almost 4 million visitors each year. Unfortunately, due to budget cuts in 2013, nearly two-thirds of their law enforcement personnel had been transferred to other parks and not replaced. To compound their already overloaded situation, within a week of Jacob's bike being found, there were two other incidents in the park, a plane crash and another missing person. The rangers were stretched thin and simply didn't have the resources or personnel to conduct a full-scale search for Jacob. It was a heartbreaking situation for Laura and Jacob's loved ones, who were left feeling helpless and frustrated by the lack of support from the park authorities. Randy, Jacob's father, dropped his hammer gun and threw his wetsuit into his truck when he heard the news. Rangers told him the bike was found near the river, and Randy had a sense he'd be searching the swift water. He picked up Mallory and sped north, driving the thousand miles from Santa Cruz straight through. When Randy and Mallory arrived at the park, five days had already passed since the rangers first discovered Jacob's abandoned bike. Other family members and friends, including Jacob's mother Laura, flew into SeaTac and drove to the park for what ended up being a tragic search and rescue mission. The family was surprised to learn that no ranger-assisted search had been launched yet. Unfortunately, national parks operate like sovereign countries, and search and rescue personnel from outside the park must be requested by park officials to initiate a search. Jacob's bike was discovered just 40 feet away from the river, which was 40 feet wide at the high water mark. On the other side of the river is Olympic National Forest, which is under a different jurisdiction. Unlike national parks, national forests operate under the county model, and the Cullum County Sheriff's Department is responsible for search and rescue there, which is only a stone's throw away from the park. Randy and Danny suited up and entered the river, but they sensed lethargy from the park officials and decided to take matters into their own hands. The family demanded an intense search, and Ranger Ray agreed to their request. Randy searched behind waterfalls, in deep holes, and under log jams, while Mallory kicked through ferns, looking for any evidence. The family was surprised to find that the park had not requested any outside assistance, such as dog teams or aircraft from Woodley Island Naval Air Station. Randy bushwhacked through thick brush and thorny devil's club in the rain, suffering from trench foot due to wet socks. Despite his physical discomfort, he remained determined to find his son alive. Surprisingly, the Coast Guard, based in Port Angeles, was not requested for assistance, nor were aircraft from Woodley Island Naval Air Station, which has been known to assist with some Olympic Park searches. Time was of the essence in the search and rescue operation, and the delay of five days and the lack of assistance from neighboring agencies greatly reduced the chances of finding Jacob alive. It was a devastating realization for the family, who were left feeling let down by the system and desperate for answers. After the discovery of the bike on April 6, 2017, the Clallam County Sheriff's Office conducted a search the following day with the help of approximately 30 people and dogs, but their efforts were fruitless. Olympic Mountain Rescue was called in nearly a week later on April 12th, and during their search, they found evidence suggesting that someone had exchanged hiking boots for running shoes, walked towards the river, and slipped and had fallen into it, leaving a mark on a mossy rock further downstream. There were signs the individual may have attempted to climb out. However, a state fisheries biologist was assigned to look through the log jams in the river instead of swift water search and rescue. On April 13th, the search for the individual became a search for a body instead of a live cyclist, and dog teams were brought in. Two cadaver dogs indicated a log jam where a corpse might be trapped, but after searching all log jams for 12 miles on both sides of the bike area, nobody was found. 
The search operation continued in Olympic National Park throughout the week, but on April 14th, the park transitioned to a limited continuous search, effectively ending the search by Olympic Rangers. After a period of over a year, specifically, on the late afternoon of Friday, August 10th, 2018, a group of biologists embarked on a trip into the mountains to study marmots. During their expedition, they stumbled upon the remains, clothing, and gear of Jacob Gray. The discovery was made at the top of a ridge located above Hole Lake, approximately 5,300 feet above sea level, and at a distance of at least 15 miles from where he abandoned his bicycle. The location where Jacob's remains were discovered was not near any trail, and during the time of his disappearance, which was in April, the terrain would have been covered in snow and potentially prone to avalanches. The remains were found on a treeless ridge, which could have been visible from the air. The story of Jacob Cray can serve as a cautionary tale for other hikers and can help them be more aware and prepared for the potential dangers of hiking in the wilderness. It highlights the importance of being prepared, taking safety precautions, being cautious, and communicating plans with others before heading out on a hike. By taking these steps, hikers can minimize risks and enjoy a safer and more enjoyable hiking experience in the wilderness. If you've enjoyed this content from a universe of mystery, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my new and upcoming content.